Uh, this whole talk is kind of about our journey from uh, migrating from, a, a, from the mainframe to a distributed architecture uh, microservices network. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we learned, um, how we did things. It's less technical talk. It's kind of a, a bridge between technical and process. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the things that we learned uh, and what we discovered. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the um, you know, the roadblocks and the gaps. And it's kind of a, a, a it's, it's taking a whole year worth of stuff and putting it into a half an hour. Uh, so bear with me. If I go a little fast or I miss something, please, please feel free to, to raise your hand and I'll slow down. Uh, so again, from mainframe to microservices. Uh, so this is a little bit about our, uh, our company and who we are. Um, this is our, we had our summit in Chicago uh, a couple months ago, and this is the, the team here. You can probably figure out the big guy out there, and then that's me. Uh, <laughs> so I'm pretty easy to spot. This is uh, my whole, whole, whole team here. Uh, so Somos is one of those companies that you probably use any one of our products and services every day, but just not know who we are. We are responsible for all the toll-free numbers in the U.S. and Canada. And so we're kind of like, as Sam Phil, uh, said, well, you guys are kind of like the DNS of uh, toll-free numbers. You're like, yeah, that's exactly what we are. Um, we're not the guys that give out the, the numbers, but uh, we have Rustborgs, you know, companies that you're all familiar with, CenturyLink, Verizon, AT&T, uh, Google, the companies, that we support what we call the responsible organizations or rest boards. They're the ones that go out and, you know, uh, deliver uh, toll-free numbers with their packages, but they're selling your website or, or what have you. They're, they're the ones that are actually um, delivering the actual numbers. What we do is to make sure it's a level playing ground so someone doesn't take 1-800-Flowers, which is probably one of the most popular uh, toll-free numbers that, that people are aware of. We, we want to make sure that Joe's Pizza doesn't take 1-800-Flowers. Uh, and so this is the, this is the team. Um, we are sanctioned by the FCC. We have a tariff, uh, and we're a neutral uh, organization. So pretty proud of that. Uh, this is me. I'm just a guy. Um, this is Stuart of uh, a lot of great people, and this is what I do. You know, originally when I came to Somos, I was a scrum master, and, um, and so there are people who don't work in the, in the engineering group that says, hey, I didn't know scrum masters did release management. I'm like, no, we don't, but I kind of got the job um, because of my past experience, and we're a very small organization. We wear many different hats. So uh, not only am I a scrum master, which works really well, when you're talking about DevOps and doing things in an agile kind of way, because you bring that experience along with the, you know, the technical backgrounds and uh, technical background and all those kinds of things that fit into what we do in our careers. So that's just me. I'm a new granddad, so I'm pretty proud about that. I mean, I wish I could put my granddaughter up there, but. Um, so let's talk about what, what, what's going on here. So we are on a mainframe. And we've been on the mainframe for 30 years, right? So I'm trying to see this here. Yeah, we've been on the mainframe for over 30 years. I, our main application runs on the mainframe, right? It's a big IMS database. It's been around for, for 30 years. We have over, you know, 41 million uh, TFN registry uh, records. And so as you can imagine, having things on the mainframe makes a little bit of challenge uh, for customers who are expecting development now, results now. It's no offense against the mainframe, okay? This is not a discussion about how bad the mainframe is. This is just our journey of moving from the mainframe to microservices architecture. Um, the, so you know, there was a number of, of things that we had to deal with, one of which was, you know, delivering things in a timely fashion. In the mainframe world, things take time, right? There, there's a talk that's going to happen tomorrow at 11 o'clock uh, by a lady named, I think, is it Rosalind? Oh, there she is. Wait, I, Oh, Wednesday, uh, she's the, uh, on the other side of the coin. She's actually the mainframe uh, goddess speaking to how great mainframe is. You just need to modernize it. Um, so we had a very interesting discussion this morning, in fact. Uh, so the other thing, too, was cost optimization. On the mainframe, things are a little bit expensive on the mainframe, especially if you're a small organization, because you, you're, you're uh, actually paying to maintain 
this big arm, right? You're, you're, you're maintaining it, it's, it's costly, uh, and it's not very, in our experience, it's not very agile, right? That's okay. There are some things that I learned to, even today that the mainframe is really good for. For what we wanted to do, it's not really good. For, it's not really good for what we wanted to do. Uh, so, let me skip to this one. So the bottom line, really, for us is what we really wanted to do is be responsive to our customer base, right? When our customers come to us and say, "Hey, we really like to have these features," I'm like, "Great! Can you wait a year? Can you wait six months to get those features? We'll get we'll, we'll get it to you," because in the mainframe world, it's a little bit different. Uh, and so we really wanted to be more, we really wanted to be more agile um, and actually be able to respond not only to our customers, we have the distinct uh, honor of, of supporting a whole industry, right? There's not many companies can say that they're supporting a whole industry. Uh, we are in that position. And so we wanted to be very agile in our response to our customers demand. So our adventure begins. So what happens? So we decided, right, after 30 years um, to, you know what, we really need to migrate off in the mainframe. We really need to, 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 to take this plunge and make this, you know, make this as a modern environment. Uh, make, make, not only make it a modern environment, but make it so we can feature-proof ourselves, right? Because there's not a lot of PL PL1 programmers around. Right? That's not a good career move if you're just graduating from school. Oh, I want to be a PL1 versus Java. So that, that's the kind of thing that we were running into. So our venture begins. So I wanted to give you a little bit of understanding of what, um, how we plan this out. So in the mainframe, the mainframe is, does very high transactional throughput. Uh, and then what we do is in the mainframe, you, you write all these interfaces for various, for, for customers and various things that you want to do to access that. Well, we wanted to make sure we could still do that, but we wanted to make sure we could do it in the microservices, uh, in the microservices world. And so what we did was overall, we, we came out with this overall plan to, um, to, to make this environment, the architect this environment in such a way is that the, to the customer, they see a new interface, but the, it, our solution does the same thing that the mainframe does. But the difference is, is that what's behind that is the layers of uh, layers of API. So it's a API, it's a layered process where uh, environment where we have uh, a business layer, we have API layer, we have gateways. Um, we're able to process the same transactions that the mainframe does. So if the mainframe, if, if you put in something to the mainframe to say do a bulk number reserve for you know a thousand numbers we need to be able to do the same thing and the customer not know the difference that we both number reserve a thousand numbers right so so we we needed to one of the requirements was to make sure that with the mainframe if you put in one and the mainframe puts out two we need to make sure our whole environment does the same thing and so that's what we, we came up with this architecture this high level architecture and this is a better view of it gosh i wish i can get down to kind of point to it but on the on the your left, um, you'll see that these are our products, uh, legacy products. On the left, these are some of those products that have been around for years. W, uh, MGI, WBA, Th those kinds of products are what our customers have been using for many years. And what that allows our customers to do, they build products around these interfaces, right? And so we want to be able to maintain those interfaces while at the same time to modernize what happens in the back end. So instead of you going to the mainframe and the mainframe processing, um, processing these, these, um, the payload, the stuff that comes through here, we wanted to put our own architecture, our own application behind it. Uh, and so it processes and gives you the same results, right? So that's really in a nutshell what we're trying to do. I don't want to get into a whole technical discussion about you know, uh, what microservice, uh, API microservices are, and there's a lot of smart guys in there. Uh, we can have that conversation offline, but essentially we took all the stuff that the mainframe does and we put it in a set of APIs. And so instead of the mainframe batch processing all this stuff, the API, APIs do it. So for instance, if you bulk number reserve something, in other words, if you go in and you find, you know, 500 uh, toll-free numbers that you want to reserve, uh, reserve against for your account and put it into what we call the RESPR responsible organization. 
Well, we may have, in that case, we have 13 different APIs that do, that do that in the background, right? And so we want this flexibility. So when we add a service or a feature, great, we'll just add an API. We'll just plug in an API and, and, and do it. Great, that, that problem solved. Well, it's not as easy as that. The, trust me, we had a lot of roadblocks and we had a lot of uh, issues in the beginning. But we, we eventually got there. I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. So moving forward, once we decided that that's what we're going to do, we have an architecture, we have a way of doing things. Um, let's go line up some vendors and some developers uh, and let's start doing this for real. Um, we, this, this, we found out that we had some problems. We had some gaps, actually. So what do we do moving forward? So the first thing we needed to do is build trust with our operations guys. Because now they're like, hey, if you're moving away from the mainframe, what happens to us? And we're like, oh, shoot, well, I guess we don't need you anymore. Bad thing, that's not true. So we had to build trust with our operations guy. So my, my colleague, his name is Mike Unoni, he is the operations guy. He's the guy that runs the mainframe for Somos. He has a bunch of vendors that work for him. He runs the mainframe. So the first thing we had to do was sit down together and, and, and build trust relationship. So he knew that, hey, listen, this is, we're still Somosians. We, that's what we call ourselves, Somosians. We're still Somosians. We still have to work together. So let's build some trust. That's one of the things we learned part in, in this journey. We had to build trust. Now, now we made a lot of mistakes. But it came down to, you know what, we really need to build a trust and relationship. You know, just because the operations does what they do, I don't need to go and put it in their face that, hey, you guys are on the mainframe, I don't need you. That didn't work so well. So that was a lesson learned. Uh, the other thing too is developing a DevOps culture. There's been a lot of discussion about d developing a DevOps culture, but in our world is a little bit different because in the mainframe world, DevOps is like, what? If you talk to a mainframe guy about DevOps, they're like, and? What, is, what DevOps, what are you talking about? I'm operations. The development guys are over there. That's kind of the attitude. That's not necessarily a bad attitude because it works on the mainframe, but it kind of works on the mainframe. But for us, we had to bring this together and make it work. So one of the things that we learned is that we had to not only build a DevOps culture, but we had to do it in a way that will work in the mainframe world, that will bring in, sort of in, ingest the, the mainframe operations guys. And what does that mean? Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, one of the other things that we, we had to do was develop DevOps as a service, right? Because in the mainframe world, you have these centers of excellence, right? You have these shops, right? In the mainframe world, you have shops. Right, you, you, you have you know the, the JCO guys, the security guys, the initiator guys, you have the database guys, right? It's an IMS database, you have the database guys. They talk about sectors, the development team, they talk about you know procedures and proc files. So we had to develop, when we moved over to the, uh, to the microservices world, we kind of took that whole mainframe kind of way of doing things and we brought it to, to, to this new world and it didn't really work well. So one of the other things that we had to do is we had to build a DevOps as a service. We had to make sure that, hey, we're not a center of excellence. DevOps is your responsibility. Yes, Mr. Developer, it's your responsibility. Yes, Mr. Operation Guy, it's your responsibility. Yes, Ms. Tester, it is your responsibility. Uh, let me move on here. Um, so it, the other thing too is, what is this? Uh, services? Oh, okay. This is a really great lesson here. This is a really great thing that we did. So, so when we, I'm really proud of this because it's a, such a simple thing. If you really want to get good consensus with people, take them to lunch, do a pizza bus, right? So we did a lot of lunch and learns where we said, okay, this is what we do in the modern side. This is what we do in the market services architecture world. This is what cloud is. And let's have a lunch and learn, right? One of the things that Somos is really great about is feeding us. As I am, as you can tell, they feed us well. And so <laughs> what we did was we put together a bunch of lunch and learns to get people involved and get them talking. What else did we do? So 
The other thing is, I, I got to tell you guys, I am, how much time do I have? Okay, I am a great, I'm a big proponent of AWS. I love AWS, and I tell you why. What AWS does for a small organization is give them flexibility, right? You remember in the book, uh, and, and, and you remember in the book in the, in the Phoenix Project, there's a, you know, Bill makes this, was it Bill that said, one of the guys makes this comment about cloud. It's like, well, what is cloud? What, what's the big deal about cloud? It's just a bunch of machines. Well, what AWS does for us, it not only gives us the machines and gives us that virtual ability to dynamically create, create stuff, it also gives us a, a, a great software development environment. If you want to set up your developers really quickly, get them on AWS. And if you really want to send them really quickly, embrace containers. So one of the things we learned is that, hey, you know what? Let's create a development environment in AWS. Now, one of the challenges that we had to overcome is that uh, not only do we have developers in the US, we have developers in India. So how do you get 100 developers, 100 testers, how do you get all those guys to work together in a seamless development environment? How do you standardize your development environment? That's what we use AWS for. So we're a hybrid solution, uh, we're a hybrid solution uh, shop where we have AWS as a development environment and our production environment is in our data center which runs VMware. So that posed a challenge. Let's talk a little bit about that. The other thing, um, that we had to do is make sure that we had the right tools, we have the right governance policies, because one of the things in the, and one of the things that we've learned is that just because, and how many times have you heard this? Agile has no boundaries, right? Agile means you just do things without any rules. That's not true. If you want Agile to fail in your environment, don't put any governance in, I guarantee you it'll fail. So not only did we have to create, uh, uh, not only do we have to create these environments, we have to train people how to use these environments, right? Because you get, if, if you don't put any boundaries, uh, any processes, the right number of processes in there, and if you don't train your people how to use your environment, they will destroy it. Be, not because they're, not because they want to, it's because you didn't tell them that, hey, don't push the red button, right? Because if you give somebody a red button, they're gonna push it, right? So we have to address that as well. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing we had to do is that we learned uh, is that we had to collect metrics, real metrics. So in the mainframe, it's really easy to do that because in the mainframe, you're kind of, the mainframe is a captive audience, right? The mainframe does really good at collecting statistics. In our microservices distributed world, it's not because we got AWS, you know, for, for our lower environments and we got the data center, uh, hybrid solution at VMware for the other environment. How do you collect you know, the suite of, of, of metrics. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you know how well you're doing? How do you know how good the process is? So if I were you, make sure whatever you guys are doing, collect the, the, a good set of metrics that's going to tell you how good your process is. Uh, and then, oh, this is great. So one of the things that, that became clear is that the way the mainframe does De deployments in a way that we had to do deployments was different, completely different. And so we have to figure out a way to, we have to figure out a way of doing that. We have to figure out a way to, to make it work in both environments. We, and, and that became a very difficult thing. And we're still, we're still kind of struggling with that, but it, we, we had to make sure that we can ensure successful deployments Every time uh, we're, I was talking uh, to, I was talking to you earlier, and one of the things that you said that rang true was that you have to do it right every time. Every time you have to do it right every time, simultaneously it has to be right every time. So when we get a bad deployment, right, or it almost works, that's a failure. So what do you do? to make sure that your, your deployments are successful. So, anyway, any, any Marines in here? Marines, well, happy birthday, Marine Corps' birthday. 
Uh, one of the things I learned in the military was this. I had a colonel tell me, tell us, I was a captain, and a colonel, a colonel used to tell us all the time, he would say, listen, there are days when the dragon eats you, and there are days when you eat the dragon. You want more days where you eat the dragon. And so we were having all the things I talked about previously. How do you address all of that? So we put together a team to build this thing to address all the problems that we were having. My boss came to me and says, how do we fix this? How do we make this work? And congratulations, you're it. Yes, sir. We'll fix it. So I put this team together. We call it Team Dragon. And our job is to go out and slay dragons. Our job is to put, not to become the DevOps team so much as to put a framework in place so our DevOps, so everybody in the environment can use, everybody on the project can use the framework. So this is what our process looks like. And these are the tools associated uh, with, our, with each part of the, the, the process. That little robot you see there is our testing, uh, is our testing framework. It's called Robot Framework, uh, and it's our automation. It's, our auto, it's a test automation stack that uses Selenium. Uh, there are other test stacks you can use, like Cucumber, but we chose Robot Framework. And some of the other products you you, you already you already know Ansible to do server mi uh, mi migration. Um, so we also have uh, Artifactory. And of course, my favorite, we have Electric Cloud that kind of orchestrates the whole thing. So, what, so, so I don't want to make this a sales pitch, but what Electric Cloud does for us is to have a one environment that pulls all of this stuff together in a seamless way. So in our solution, Electric Cloud didn't come in and replace everything. It came in and integrate integrated everything. So for example, when we want to, uh, when we do bills, we took the, we take the bills and we put it into auto factory and then we use pipelines and deployment and an deployment module, uh, part of the application module, uh, application, uh, when you do the application, uh, model is to go in and pull out certain things. Like for instance, when you do a build, we go in auto factory and pull it out. Right. So, so we're not using electric cloud for that. We, we are getting rid of some of our Jenkins jobs and replacing them with CICD process in the electric cloud. So the electric cloud gives us that ARA, that, that orchestration, sort of that, that, that one tool that brings all the other islands of tools uh, into play. Now, what's the advantage of that? Well, then we're not reliant on just using one tool. If we want to go out and use, um, let's say we do want to use Jenkins. Right? Great. We'll just have Electric Cloud call Jenkins when we do X, Y, and Z with, with Jenkins. Or you can have Electric Cloud replace and do it all, all that for us. So that gives us, uh, that gives us a lot of flexibility. Here's another view of kind of our governance model. This is how, okay, so in the mainframe, there's a lot of, there's a bunch of checklists and, and I love checklists. Being in the military, we use checklists all the time. But in the mainframe, you have these giant run books. Right. And, and then when you do, if you've ever been in a mainframe deployment, you have this, these meetings, right? You have these meetings uh, and in these meetings, you go through the run book, right? It's, it's an hour long meeting. Hey, we're going to do this. Who's going to do that? Okay. That's the, you know, telemetry shop down there. They're going to do that. And the database guy, oh yeah, we're going to take the sectors and we're going to resector them, you know, whatever. And we have the ceramic oscillator team or whatever they do. Um, I'm being coy, trust me, there's more work, there's real work that they actually do. So we had to take their process and our process and put it together and so on a workable solution because our, the first phase of applicants, this is something I didn't tell you, the first phase of our application actually runs on top of the IMS database that's part of the mainframe, right? So I can't ignore the processes and all the great work that the mainframe does. They have a very mature process. So we got together and we said, hey, you know what? Let's make a combined process and governance model that's going to work for all of us. And that took a lot of negotiation. So what I'm saying up here is, is easy. It took me three or four months to, to get through and to, and to combine on and, and to collaborate on. Bridging the culture of gaps. There are cultural gaps 
in any kind of migration from anything. So let's go through that real quick because my time is running short and Abigail's going to yank me off stage. Um, we had to make sure our processes work together. That was the, because the mainframe process, as I, as I talked about, is completely different than what we do over here in the microservices distributed Java world. Right? The Java developers process? What's the process? You mean the initiator? What are you talking about? What's the process? So we have to fix that. Uh, I'm going to run through these real quick. because I'm going to get to the end goal here. I'm going to get to the bottom line here. I'm going to show all this here. This is my favorite one. Talk it out. When you fail, fail fast and then talk about it. Talk about it. Because one of the things that we had to do was retrospectives. We had to actually talk about stuff, no guessing, no guessing. So uh, my colleague, Mike Unoni, who's an operations team. Hey, Mike, we really failed on that one. Let's talk it out. Here's what we did. Here's what we did right. Here's what we should keep doing. Here's what we really screwed up on. Talk it out, no guessing. In your environment, it's just like a, a, a relationship. I'm not giving marriage advice here, but I tell my wife all the time, baby, don't make me guess. Just tell me what's wrong. Please, just tell me what the problem is. Don't make me guess, because I'm going to be bad at it, and you're going to get mad at me. So no guessing, right? Talk it out, talk it out, talk it out. And if you find that you have repeatable processes, right, in the mainframe, that's in the run book. Automate your run book. What a novel, what a novel concept. Automate your run book, right? So when you got, when you have all these processes and the, the culture and the mainframe, things are not automated very much. But in our world, things have to be automated. We want to get to the point where we're not even touching the, the system. We're going to give a pipeline to a guy or a gal and they're going to push the button. They're going to do everything they need to do in that pipeline. That's my goal. So let's run through this because my time is running out. Uh, results. Let's talk about our results. In the mainframe world, when we do a deployment, it takes all night. You get on a call and it takes all night. We're really great people. I love them dearly, but it takes all night. So we went from, we went from taking hours a day to do deployment to hours. In the AWS environment, it takes 20 minutes to do a deployment, right? So you get a, so, so we've run away from, getting a bunch of people on the phone to say, hey, we got to push the deployment in UAT uh, in AWS. Okay, what do what we got to do? What, what's, once, once our product owner says it's good to go, we push the button. We go to Electric Cloud, we got a pipeline, we got a deployment release, we push it, we run our tests against it, and we make sure it works, and we say, hey, UAT testing team, it's all yours. That takes 20 minutes. So we went from having maybe five deployments because deployments in the mainframe world are risky to us. I want to do hundred deployments a day. I want to know what works and what doesn't work right now. I have to stop and slow down when I go into production because they're not going to allow me to go into production doing 20 deployments a day in production. I understand that. So those are one of the compromises we had to do. But my goal is at the end of the year is to get to seven deployments in the other environments. Right. I want to be able to deploy hourly, you know, whatever it takes. So my mainframe guys think that's crazy. I'm, I'm going to win them over, though. Uh, let me wrap this up. Um, uh, da, 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 da. That's not important. That's not important. Oh, better cost optimization. That's important. Right. Because now I can go to my leadership and say, hey, I want to spend X amount of dollars doing X, Y, and Z and, or, you know, with a new tool or whatever everything. And, and I can really tell, I can now say, this is how much money we're saving. This is what our cost optimization is. We're able to do things. We're able to tell and predict what our costs are now because now we're cost optimized. That's important. So I summarize all the stuff that we did in a year, we're still in that journey. The next phase of the project is to take it off of IMS and move it to a relational and not and some some non-SQL databases. So that's our journey. If you got any questions, please stop me in the hallway. I'll be here all week. Thank you very much for your attention.